So uh, thank you for coming, everyone. This is Jane Zorakowski. Um, we're just gonna, we've only just met today, so we're going to have a live chat of getting to know each other. Um, yeah. Jane's background is in production management in television. Mm -hmm. So right. tell us how it started. How did it start? So my degree was in business studies, and I had gone travelling and I came back. To, I'm from Liverpool, by the way, near Liverpool. It's like Scouts. Congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> Although I'm an Evertonian, but we won't say okay. that. <laughs> Um, and I, I applied for a runner's job at Granada Television, and that was only going to be a four-week placement. And I knew nothing about TV whatsoever. And I remember turning up, and I was literally handed, can you do this, this, and this? And I didn't know. It's pretty much sort of like rabbit in headlights. But the thing is, you just get on with it. You have to find a way and you have to be very proactive. And that led me to being extended for another month, which then led on to me being at Grand for four years. And I started as a runner. And I know that when you come into industry, you've got fantastic qualifications, but please just remember the runner's role is absolutely key and really quite important. So for me, it was like being a sponge. So I got to see a 360 degree sort of, um, uh, I was in the environment of, of, of creatives as well as production management. And I got to work across both genres. Uh, and I knew very early on that my expertise were probably going to be more suited to the production management route which I'll come on to you because I know people like what is production management. I know we're going to talk about that further. So what I was saying is I started off as a production runner and then I got, um, then I got uh, promoted to production coordinator and I worked out of the newsroom. So I was responsible for coordinating all the local news teams for Granada Television. And that was, being in a newsroom is pretty full on and that's, and I got to do auto cue badly. Um, <laughs> in fact, it was going backwards at one point. Um, and, but you are, you're just thrown in it and you just have to sink or swim. And I think that's what I was going to say, because when I was reading your perspective, I think it's brilliant how Screenology is set up, because I think it's all about hands-on, because nobody's an expert. I'm still not an expert in my field, but I'm learning every day. So anyway, so from crew coordinator, I then moved to network television. So um, Fiona might remember World in Action, yep. <laughs> uh, which was the ITV's current affairs flagship show. It had been going for a good 30 years plus. And so this is when I was exposed to foreign travel. So I was able to go, and f go out with the film crews and, and film um, outside the UK, which is great. Uh, went to America, uh, Israel. Um, and so I was there, so, so being a um, production coordinator in World in Action was quite intense because we would do crash programs. So if something current or something really important in the news happened, we would be turning around a program within two weeks, an hour program, a half an hour program, sorry. So that was pretty full on. Again, I tended to be on programs that were always pretty frenetic, but I think that was great. That's what I think that's what I loved the buzz. Enjoy it. That yeah. was that was my buzz. So when we when I finished World in Action, a lot of the B, a lot of the ITV journalists moved to BBC. And you know McIntyre undercover. So, so Daniel oh, yeah, McIntyre yeah, yeah. was an yeah. undercover investigator. So we all sort of moved to the BBC, and I started my career at the BBC back in '98. And um, I was in documentaries for quite a while. But then I got, um, I got asked to do maternity leave for Crime Watch, the production manager on Crime Watch. And all of a sudden, it was just like, wow, I'm back in the studio and it's live again. And I think for me, my passion was then sort of set. I really enjoyed production managing live shows. So I did Crime Watch UK, I did Watchdog for many series. Um, I did Chelsea Flower Show, which is one of the most delightful ones. That's great. Um, but I was going to say dire. <laughs> like, yeah, how can Chelsea like, Flower like, Show be horrible? But I think for me, what was amazing is I, I got to start the one show. So I was there for series two, three and four with Adrian and Christine. And just as Chris Evans was starting, I was pregnant at the time and, and mm -hmm. went into another role. But for me, the one show, I mean, I know people are like, oh, the one show, but actually it is that fun and it's different every day, and the team is like a family. And I think that's what I love about Live, is that it's a collective 
um, goal. Nobody, you, you're all a sum of parts. You cannot operate as a single person. You know what I mean? You, 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 it's a domino effect. But it's, it's that camaraderie which I really loved and fixing things. How many people so, might be in a team on a so, show like that? So, on the one, so when you look at the one show, I'll tell you how it's set up. So the one show, you have so many inserts, don't you? The short form films. We commission indies around the UK to make um, those films. So you'd have a genre of natural history or a genre of current affairs. Current affairs are made in Manchester. Some of the natural history are made uh, down in, here in Bristol by Icon or in House of BBC. And so we commission three, I don't know how many films a year. But then we, cr we produce also with our team, uh, the studio team, we have a, uh, an insert which is topical. So we would literally um, have, uh, um, say, people want to talk about Brexit. So we would do a film about Brexit, some announcements being made. But we would literally find the stories, shoot, edit within three days. And sometimes we are literally putting tapes into the EVS as we're transmitting. The one show team structure, the teams, we have four teams and they leapfrog each other. So you don't have a team Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You do a Monday show, you do a Friday show, then you do a Thursday show, then you do a Wednesday show. So you constantly meet. So you've got a couple of days lead in each yeah, time. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So you have three days prep, transmission, three days prep. So as a production manager, I would have my schedule of my whole staff so I could see all the transmissions across um, the months. And I would just make sure that sort of I kept all that on track. And also we would have, so we'd have about 40 staff and then we'd have, on top of that, we'd have the studio crew. So in the end, there's about 70, 80 people I was responsible for in the unit. Um, but it was a well-oiled machine. You have a set, like you do, you know, you have your, your sort of uh, set time of the day when you need to do stuff and need to prep. But just if anybody's interested, how the one show works the day after transmission, you sit there in the green room, you have a debrief, and everyone has a comment about what they liked about the show, what they didn't like about the show. Then you'll talk to then the producer of the that night's show will talk about what's coming up in the show tonight. And then we would have a script meeting, and then we would go through the script and we would plan. And then you'd have another meeting after that, which is the, night, the day before, so you'd have the next person who's gonna be transmitting the day after. So we go and talk to them about anything else that we need to sort out for their transmission day. And then, just I'd have spent most of my time just talking to staff and because it's 70 staff is really difficult you know what I mean so a lot of my stuff was welfare and just changing things and moving people around and and then we would have the presenters would come in about two o'clock and you'd have a script meeting with them and then the crew would come in at three and you probably all know this you'd have a block through do you know what block through is right so you get your camera you get your camera script so the the PA who does who has the script has or sits with the director and they talk about what shots and cameras and all that. So we have a block through. So the director would go with the studio team, um, cameras, jib operator, whatever. They would go through um, the script in terms of camera shots and where they go, yeah, rehearsal. So then after that happens, go to makeup and then we have a rehearsal. Now for live shows, you will always, you've done, you probably know, you've always reverse, uh, you always rehearse from the end, so the top. So basically, by the time you finish rehearsal, you're back into position one, and then you're oh, ready to go. That's, that's how confusing. They do it. Yeah, it's really confusing. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and that's how the one shot. Because the thing is, we have to do it that way because we are pretty tight for time and what have you. So, and it's a half an hour show, and there's always so much packed in. So that's how we sort of. Oh, you're interested in that. So how long I went. You, I went off. That's right. How long did you do the one show for? I did the one show for three series, and then I talent managed. So I was. Yeah, so what does that mean? So a talent manager. So I was recruiting uh, editorial talent, not on screen talent, but yourselves. So I would be looking. So for example. I'll be working with the production manager who was on the one show then and saying, right, what are your gaps coming up? Because people want to take holiday or people wanted to leave. And I'd be saying, right, we need a studio director, or sorry, studio researcher, studio AP. So I would then have to go and source those people. But I would be constantly meeting people with their CVs and going through all their skill set and banking them on my database thing, right, okay, one to watch or they've got the right skills and you, you should keep tabs on people. So talent, so that's what I'm sort of doing now for this independent, which we'll talk about, but I'm looking um, for obviously new directors coming through and, and what have you. So just ones to watch. 
Cool. Well, you're yeah. in the right place. I am in the right place, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah do, you want to, do you want to talk a bit about where you are now or do you want to go back? I know, sorry, I went so all right. That was a very places. quick whiz through your journey. I'm so sorry. Yeah, that was my That's that was right. journey. So, yeah, I mean, so... So, so shall I t finish my journey? So, yeah. So, so, after the one show, as I said, I got pregnant. So, I went after I had Joseph, I came back and talent managed. So, I looked after the programmes that I used to production manage because I knew... Because I was doing it anyway, but they just suddenly created these roles. So they made that as a new role? They made that as a new role, yeah. yeah. So I um, worked in features and docs. And then, on a sideline, my husband worked um, for OBs outside broadcast. So he's an engineer. We met on a programme, which I must talk about. Because okay. it was one of the most disastrous programmes ever. <laughs> the only thing to come out of it was... You met your mom, husband. At least Jane Wright found a husband. <laughs> um... um so he then retrained to be an osteopath. And, and so we decided when he graduated, we would leave London because we just thought we need a whole change of lifestyle. And so I moved to BBC Bristol. Stefan and I moved um, outside Bristol instead of our practice. And so I worked with Sasha Mertzoff, documentary maker, who, has anyone seen Drugs Land? No, you must watch it. It came out a year last February, and it's fantastic. So it's a, it's a, it's a series about the whole... Um, perspective of drugs in terms of the police dealing with it, the drug addicts, the actual uh, drug dealers and recreational drugs and you know, it's, it's, it's brilliant. It was, it was up for a BAFTA and um, sadly didn't get it but it's worth watching. So anyway, he's a fantastic documentary maker and I worked with him on protecting our foster kids which was quite harrowing. So for me it's so difficult to go from live fun entertainment stuff to really serious life-changing and privileged stuff to work on, I would say. Um, so I did that, and then I decided to have a couple of years sabbatical, tried to get redundancy, didn't get redundancy. Um, <laughs> and, and so I decided to leave the BBC after 18 years there. And then I joked and said to Sasha, look, if you set up your own indie, I'll come and work with you. And of course, he rings me in June and said, by the way, you know, and I was a lady of leisure, walking my dogs and having a nice time. <laughs> um, and so I said, yeah, so I'm working two days a week with him. But what, during my sabbatical, I did, work, did do some lecturing and production management um, for Bournemouth University. And I've done a couple of talks like this before because I need to get the word out that production management is a viable option in the media industry that nobody, people overlook. Tell us yes. about me and your husband then. That, and absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> what was yeah. terrible about that show? What was terrible about, okay, so Fat Nation, right, okay, so 2004, right, BBC One, Lorraine Hegarty at the time, decided she wanted to have a uh, series all about healthy eating. And so we thought, right, was with Matt all right, we're gonna teach the nation how to eat. Well, and so we found, uh, no disrespect to them, we found a, an estate in Birmingham that had a lot of obesity. And, um, and so we went live every night from this, uh, from this, um, yeah, from this cul-de-sac. But so let's go back a bit. So I was at Chelsea Flower Show. I get the phone call and say, they're doing this programme. We need you to come and take over from the production manager on the BBC One show. I, I'm, so on, on this particular what particular show, because uh, they had a spin-off for BBC Three. So I said, okay, yeah, fine, okay. So I, I remember the director at the time was um, <sighs> fantastic guy. He was doing Strictly Come Dancing as well at the time. And he had sort of big budgets in his head. And of course, he came down and it was literally like, this isn't working, this isn't working, this isn't working. I'm just like, I have just arrived on set. I don't know what's happening. And at that point, when you've got people standing there who've lost confidence and they're looking at you to solve the problem, you can't go, well, I don't know. You're like, right, okay. And I remember walking away going, what in the hell? So what I did is I decided, because you don't know everything, but you know what? You build up your content and say, right, I know a person who knows this information. So I went straight back to London, called a meeting of all the heads of the department and said, right, we need to get this, we need to get confidence back in our director, we need this. And I said, so, I, so instead of saying this, this and this, I said, what do you need, what do you need, what do you need? And so it was basically, a, again, a, this collective responsibility that we need to get on air, we're on air in about four weeks, the rehearsal did not go well and so we need to you know, um, get on top of it and sort it out. And I was like, I can't believe where the inner strength came from. I think this for me was my big career 
break in 2004, it's just like, I've got to stand up to the plate now. And I remember going to the head of OB saying, I want that engineering manager removed and I'm bringing on the person I worked for Chelsea who I know and trust. And Steve and I went down the train, we did the recce, we did all the logistics, we came back on the train, wrote it up, sent it off and said to all the heads, you know, this, this and this is, this is going to happen. And one of them was my husband being pulled on to the location to help out, you see. So that's how I got to meet Stefan. Um, <laughs> all planned. Um, but you, but, but it is, it, it's that, like, you cannot say, oh, I can't do it. You have to find a way. And the thing is, there's people around to help you because you're not going to know everything. And, and so we got on air, we made it, the ratings weren't brilliant, and then the channel was saying, well, can we move it to a different slot for half an hour? And when you've got the exec saying, can we do it, Jane? And you're looking at all those logistics, and you have to say, actually, no, it's like moving a mountain. You can't, we cannot, I'd love to say yes, but we cannot do it. So it's live show, and they want to live move it to a different they slot. They want to move it to a different yeah. slot, and you can't. When you've got all your craft people organised and, and, and contracted, but saying that, on, on the streets, it was not just the logistics of the OB. We had, I should have said, we had a lady who was, had mental issues behind the studio who played loud music before we went on air. We had picketing and writing, basically, by some of the residents who were upset that some, some editorial person had been removed from the programme because he was very, very difficult and he... Uh, that was legitimate, but they did, they didn't understand TV, so they were just like, "Well, we want him back." We and they were like, they were li so we had all sorts. It was literally like a revolution on this cul de sac, <laughs> seriously. Um, but we got through it, you know, and we did it, and you know, and to this day, if you were to ask Matt Allwright and and Lee Strawson, my exec, you know, we all just went, "Oh my God, that was a career crucifixion." It really was. <laughs> but you have to see the positives out of it. Yes, I laugh and say yes, Stefan. But actually, it was it was a when things really did go wrong, and how you handle it, and how you handled your team, and how you kept everyone buoyant, and how you just had to keep going. And even though it's difficult, you will have, all of you, you will have those really difficult programmes when you think, I so don't want to be on this anymore. I just want to just literally run away. But you have to do it and you have to take the positives from it because it's not the stresses. Your heart stops going, oh my God, this has happened, what do I do? But you just have to, you know, yeah. So I think that thing about yeah. knowing that you don't know all the answers is really, yes. really key. You know, there's, I think especially when you're starting out as that expectation, you think, I'm, I can't go and do this thing if I don't know everything. Yeah. I was just stepping in and thinking, it's okay to say you don't know everything and to ask for help is, yeah. is really important, yeah. I think. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You have to, and the thing is, you know, you have to, because I always say to people, when I, when I do my talent managing and I look through CVs and they're saying, well, I can do it. I'm like, well, I've got this junior role. Wouldn't you prefer to absolutely smash that junior role to show the editorial, you know, who I'm working with, those people, that you're absolutely, you're capable of more, instead of literally going in there, falling flat on your face, or something goes wrong, and you go, mm, you know, don't be out of your depth. I'd ra I've always played it safe, and the thing is, it's, you know, I, I sometimes, I had opportunities to production exec, go outside, unit manager, all that, but I decided, you know what, I love shop floor. And I'm still happy at 20 years to say I'm a senior production manager and talent manager. It doesn't matter. I've got contemporaries who are all sort of flight. But it's what you enjoy most about the job. And I, and I don't really want to sit behind a desk and... and you know, like being do, out there doing yeah, it. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. You need to be doing it. But what I'm saying is just don't run before you can walk. And this is why when people say to me, oh, God, run this role. Great. Look at it. It's like, and you prove yourself indispensable. And there's someone say, oh, actually, do you want this? Oh, actually, we'll give them that or give them this. And that's how it happened for me. I mean, I was being literally going, go on, Jane, you can do it. I'm going, I can't, I can't. But I had great ambassadors for me who just said, you know what, just put your... I was always put on difficult shows. And I think, <laughs> the reason, I think the reason being is that I love people and I love building a team and, and having that sort of, come on, we can do it. And I think, I would say that's probably my strength, not the financial or the logistics, it's, it's the communication, but I absolutely adore about the job as people. 
Mm. There's a bit of finance and logistics, there has but to be mostly financing. people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. What do you? So, what's the new, the new job in Bristol? So, the new job in Bristol. So, Sasha Mertsov, this director, is talking about. He's decided to set his own indie. So, we are called Marble Films, and we uh, were established last July, and we got a commission straight away from BBC Three. Um, and we are doing a three-part series about uh, county lines. That's all I can say at the moment. Intriguing. Yes, very intriguing. So we don't know when we're going to deliver that because it's always fraught with, you know, legals and all sorts. But anyway, it's, it's, but that's great. And then we're doing a, um, hopefully, if we get all the funding in place, um, a Storyville, um, uh, which hopefully will get part funding and it'll be a, th a theatrical release um, about uh, the syndrome locked in which, uh, yeah, which is uh, very interesting. Not many people know about it, so that's uh, another one. And then we've got, the thing is, at the moment, it's great because we don't have to be just relying on BBC, so we're, we've got ideas into Netflix, Channel 4, obviously, because they're coming here. So we, we're quite, and the thing is, Sasha's also got um, a natural history background, mm -hmm. so um, those human sort of stories, not just the animals, it's just, you know, that side of things. So. So we're looking at um, possible, um, obviously, uh, program ideas in that in that genre. So yeah, I did ask him if he can do something about fluffy bunny rabbits or something because it's just so it's like what, nothing, nothing too depressing. Crime, another drugs thing, you know. So yeah, yeah. No one wants to hear his happy stories. No, I know, I know. So yes, yeah, so I'm working part time for him at the moment. Too. Cool. Has anyone got any questions at this stage? Somebody must have questions. Go on then. I was wondering if it would be possible for you to talk about. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was called when you went and did things in Israel. Oh, That's right. Why you talk about you maybe your experiences filming there. Oh, God. Well, I was only... <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, it, the thing is, it's so difficult because you've got, um, you've got the Palestinian, haven't you, and the Israelis. So you've got to... So basically, when I was there, I was only running for a couple of days. But what I did see is that you've got to be extremely... Um, sensitive to all those things so we had a fixer in each so you couldn't have a fixer that went across the borders and stuff so it was and also we had to take at the time because this is going back to the 90s go on so do you fix exactly you was it no it no gosh no no this is a world in action uh, program so it was uh, it was it was just we were interviewing some it sounds really boring we were interviewing some heads um what was the thing do you know it's so back a long time ago i'm just <laughs> saying to fiona because we're my brain's adult. Um, what was it about? It was um, it was something to do with artwork, I think. And there was there was there was there was it was something to do with artwork and, and things were being sort of pilfered. And but we were we were only in Ezra for a couple of days doing some talking heads with some experts. But I remember because I was just I was helping out and and I got to go and I was with the fixer most of the time. But we had two fixers because we were crossing the border into, into Palestine. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, I, I felt it wasn't, it wasn't very, I felt, didn't, I didn't feel very safe at the time, I remember, because back in the 90s, it was, yeah, it wasn't, no, no, no. But that's, um, but, but I did something in the States with them, about Monica Lewinsky, remember, the, which was, that was. About the portrait. About the, this was the, her, yeah, well, her and um, Clinton, the affair and stuff, yeah, so we did. Um, the dress. The dress. The dress. The dress. The dress. And you know what, we had, <laughs> I remember, I, we had, we flew in, we did some interviews, and then we did some reconstruction. I remember we hired um, these actresses, and I remember just saying, all you have to do is sit here and have a coffee and be talking to each other. And she <laughs> The actress says, "But well, what's my motivation in this scene?" And I was going, "I don't care. We're just uh, you're having a coffee. Around. You're just having a coffee. And we're just we're literally going to be doing a, like a wide shot, and that's it. But what's my motivation in this scene?" Like, okay, but, but that was that. Do you know what? That was interesting because we couldn't get back in time to record the commentary, so we had to do the commentary wild, and they were recording it in London. And I think we only had an hour before transmission. And I remember I was responsible for the line feed and getting the line feed up and talking to NCR. And I was just like, oh my God, did you? We had to get protected lines and all sorts. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that, was, that was quite full on. Yeah. 
I'll try and remember that is really. Do you know what? Because I was only there for two days. The thing is, because I was I was coordinator, I didn't get involved in the editorial, so I can't remember exactly. I just knew I was going out to. If you're doing the, sorry, if you're doing the management, does that mean you're working quite so closely like, with the fix? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. wondering what it's like working with local fixes, or how. I mean, I don't know how Brilliant. involved you were then, but kind of like how you go about kind of finding them and working with them, like what work that's like. Okay, so when we when I when I do my talk about. Um, setting up foreign travel, I always, always, I think people should always use fixers because they have local knowledge, they have local customs and all that sort of stuff. You need to use that intelligence. It's really important. And also other productions of, as you, you know, you've asked me, what's it like to film out in Israel? I should then give you a spiel and sort of tell you and my experiences. But it's those, it's those helpful tips. And I think being at the BBC was brilliant because of so much foreign travel. You just went to the international filming unit and they would tell you actually, don't do this, don't do that, go to that person, this is a proper fixer, this is a fixer approved. I think now being an indie, what would I do? I would just get recommendations from my other production managers who they've used and who they absolutely know and trust. Or you would go to the film bureau of that particular city that you're going to and they would have a list of accredited fixers and what have you. So you, I would go for proper bona fide, yeah, yeah, yeah. And also get them with a car because the last, th seriously, I would spend the money because the last thing you want to do is, you know, it, you've got people can just say, I'll take you to A, B and C, no, you can't go there, this and that and blah, you know, so, so yeah. But my experience of Fix has been fantastic. I was going to say, shall I just explain, does everyone know what production management is? No. Right, shall I explain? Go shall for I it. Go? Right, yeah. okay. Pro production management 101. Uh, right, this is the most simple, okay, fine. So, you have two houses, you have production management and you have editorial, okay? So product, so, so if you think about it, you're probably all going down the editorial route. Well, hopefully it'll be production managers, some of you. I mean, this, so. Hopefully. <laughs> I build the house. You tell me how you want to build the house and what you want to put in it, okay? So, and then I can then do the plans. The two are symbiotic. They cannot exist without the other, okay? So I make all your dreams come true, okay? So I want to do this and I want to do that and you're like, right, okay, it'll cost you this and the schedule will be this and you'll need these people, la, 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 la. That's simple layman terms, that's what we do. We're not all about budgets and spreadsheets. I was gonna say, one of the questions I always ask some of the students, if I was to give you three, so budget, logistics and communication, how would you break them down in percentages? of what the job is. Mostly communication. Yes. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. So I would say, in fact, I had arguments with my other production managers about this, because I, for me, 70% has been my job has been uh, communication and logistics and budget equals 15 each. I, some people argue, no, there's more logistics, but actually, you've got to pull everything together. So how, are, so answering your question, how I would start is, you come to me with a treatment. I'm like, right, okay. I pull out all that information from the treatment. The first thing I'm picking up on that treatment is, do you know what? Would you, I don't know, what would you think it is? What would be the first thing? People. Huh? People. No, delivery. When do you have to deliver? So that will be my first starting point. Then I'll be pulling information like, oh, it's a six-part series of BBC One, and in my head I'm knowing sort of roughly how much that would cost. Are the contributors, is there, is there a narrator, is there a celebrity, where's their foreign travel, is there... So I'm pulling all this information and then I will start to build, first of all, the schedule, because the schedule then will feed the budget. So do you work backwards? So I work backwards. So you put, so you do a timeline and you'll have, that's when your TX is. So you know from TX to TX. Say, sorry, transmission. Sorry, <laughs> transmission, sorry. Delivery to the channel or transmission. So for a live show for me, there's no, there's no end product, is it? It's the live show. So for me, a transmission is my delivery. For a documentary, it might be, you're gonna deliver in July, but it won't be transmitted until whenever. But you know that that's, so you work from your delivery. You'll know then coming back from that, how many days post you need, post-production? How many days editing do you need? So you slowly, so six weeks, so you're working back, you're two weeks of post-production, then you're six weeks of offline, you need a couple of weeks to have your edit. This will be your filming period. How many days are you going, how, where are you going to, and blah, blah, blah. And then you have your prep and, you, and your pre-production and then your start date. So then I would have my timeline 
And I would go through that with the exec and say, are you happy with this? And then we would go through the budget. And when you come to do staffing, it's really important. Don't be just like, well, that person's free, so we'll put them on. It's all about, this is what I'm saying about the job, it's juggling the whole thing. So you're like, right, okay. So say Tom is available next week, but actually hasn't got the right skills, but I know Billy's available two weeks later. You'll work out your staffing. Well, I'll bring the researcher on to do some legwork now, and then Billy can come on in that week because that person's, so he's available. Do you know what I mean? And it's a fantastic jigsaw puzzle. In fact, that's what I'm saying. It's really creative. So people think, oh, bring it to me. We are there like that. And the thing is, the schedule and the budget. So once you've locked your budget, okay, because then you, cause you need to sign up from the channel and say, I want 150,000. They'll say, yeah, Jane, here you are. After that, the budget can be put one side and I can move my money around, just as long as I don't go on over that. But it may be like the Billy's rate is higher than Tom's rate or the, you know, so you're just constantly sort of juggling. And so you, you, you're then sort of looking at, um, so once we've got the staffing and you've contracted them, you're thinking about the craft crew and you've got to get in really early with the craft crew. And what I talk about craft crew is your directors of photography, your offline editors, you will have people you know you can deliver, and so you're booking them up way in advance. And so, so yes, yeah, so you've got those um, uh, booked, and then this is when you're doing your post-product deals. So, so you do your deals with camera kit, or you're doing your deals with the post-production house, or deals with studio. You know, I might be setting up a studio in the middle of nowhere, like Chelsea Flower Show, and so it's, it's all those things you're needing to put all these deals together. So really for us, the frenetic part is at the, right at the beginning with the treatment, the staffing, the pre-production, set everything up, and then really that production period when they're filming. Just goes really smoothly. Goes really smoothly. <laughs> but it's, with, it's troubleshooting. And then it starts getting really, really busy just before the edits, make sure everything's fine. But then it's pretty frenetic at the end when you come to deliver. So does that sort of answer your question in terms of the timeline? So it's the, yeah, so, okay. So we get them making films really quickly. Yes. So that's condensed into a few days. That's but you, incredible, But yeah. you're going through all those processes yeah. without necessarily yeah. realising yes. you're doing it. absolutely, absolutely. Because you do, you suddenly think, God, when have they got to have this? When's the deadline? That's your delivery, isn't it? So, yeah. Yeah. So in terms of going to, just going back to the differences between editorial and production management. So the roles, so the roles you have, so the runner sits on the bottom and that's great because you get, as I said, you get that immersive view of both sides because one minute, I mean, you'll be making, you could be making cups of tea, photocopying, doesn't matter, but you'll be listening, you can ask questions, people love talking about themselves, okay, I'm <laughs> sorry, I don't, no, but you know what I mean, but we do, we love to, people love to, oh yeah, have you seen this, have you done this, and I, so anyway, so the run, the run of role is there, and then that's when you decide which sort of role you want to go down, now that was very traditional in the BBC, I think it's really quite mixed now, I've got a production coordinator, who's been doing um, a show reel that's gone to Netflix because he came up with the programme idea and he's been editing it on his Apple laptop. And so it's great. So I really feel that you shouldn't just be like, well, I'm just going to be a director, I'm just going to be this and that. The t there can be some grey bits now. And I think in all dancing, it's great. But sometimes you will lean towards a specialism that you're real passionate about or you've got a real flair for. And that's what I loved about the ideology of screenology is because you can do that, you've got the freedom to do that and you can go, well, actually, I'm really good at this. So you may be sitting there thinking, actually, I'm bloody good at, you know, pulling teams together, I'm bloody good at organising. Maybe production management is something you should be quite, you know, you, know, you should investigate. Um, and I'm happy to, because I do have students who ring me and just talk to me about what's your experience of this, and, and I'm happy to ring, you know, it's no problem at all. I think we were saying, you know, it's just giving back. I mean, I'm 50 next year, and I'm like, actually, my career's taken off again, which is great, but, you know, I'm only doing it part-time, and, and um, yeah. But anyway, sorry, I, digre I do digress. I'm sorry, so sorry. So we've got, so we've got the runner role here, and then for me, I would have production secretary, so they would be just doing taxi bookings and, and hotel bookings, minimal and small budgets, and then a production coordinator. Now, production coordinators at the BBC looked after massive budgets because the production managers would look after a portfolio of programming. Okay. So we would be quite senior in terms of our output could be across all our things, 
like two or three million and what have you. So the coordinators, we don't flinch if they're looking after budgets for about 250 to 300,000, okay? So, but in the Indy, so you go up the production secretary, production coordinator, a lot of responsibility. You would look after the day-to-day -day of the running of the programme. Okay, I would do all the massive setting up, setting up systems, they would help me, and then it's just literally you deal with the, the team on a day-to-day -day business. So they'd be dealing with the producers and the APs and the researchers. Production management, I would be dealing with the series producer and the exec. So it would be, it would be something that's sort of serious, a staffing issue or what have you, so I would get involved in that. You asked a question about the one show. My job on the one show, I cannot tell you. When I first joined, it was after the first hit, nobody took any time off. And I just said, well, where's the plan for the staffing? And they were like, we haven't got one. I was like, so I created- just keep coming to work. Yeah, absolutely. So I love Excel. So I created this Excel spreadsheet. Love Excel, you have to love Excel. So this Excel spreadsheet, and I had four teams, and I had prep, 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 TX, prep, 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 TX, prep. And it's boring, but the thing is, I knew where everybody was. And so if so-and-so wanted to take a day off, I just said, well, you can swap with that team member because they're on their first day prep and they can be helping on TX day. So I literally, it was like, it was like the war rooms. I was literally <laughs> shuffling people around. But then with the pressures of live show, I just had people sitting you know, because we used to have used the old sofa uh, for the ones who were sitting behind me. And they used to come and chat. And I think it was a lot of welfare and a lot of sign off as well, because the thing is, they'd say, right, tomorrow we want 12 ballerinas in the studio, not in the studio, down in the atrium. We need to do this and that. And you're like, you know, and we've had, we've had, oh my God, we've had bubble machines, we've had mop snow machines, what, what else have we had? We've, we've had REM tribute bands, well you know, we've had all sorts. And they come to you, and the thing is you can't say, you want to say, say no. you know what you want to say, you know what, I can't be bloody arsed organising that, I really can't. But, you do, and it's good fun. And the thing, honestly, we've had, I've, I, I've been, we had David Guest on one time, and I, he got stuck on the A40, and we were live, and they were like laughing, saying, you know what, he is in the car here, we will get it, our production manager, Jane, is just running down now, and you can see it, and this, this shot of me running down, his down. Car. I'm oh. running down White <laughs> City, trying to flag this thing down. But, you know, it's, it's been, do you know what, the one show, I can look at the smile on my face, the one show was an absolute blast, it, it was absolutely my baby, and, and I'm very, very fond of it. So anyway, so we have, God, I can't, I can't digress. <laughs> so we have, so we have the production, so the production manager route, and then you would go to um, unit manager, Manager, which I was at, and then production exec, and they would look after genre. So you'd have a production exec looking after the whole of documentaries unit or natural history unit or, you know, those types of arts drama, whatever. And then you would have your head of production. So for Marble Films, I'm sort of production talent head of all that because there's only about eight of us. And then we have a chief operating officer who works one day a week from London. Um, so that's Iris. So it's Sasha, Iris, me, a coordinator, and then about five for our production team. But hopefully we're going to... So then you bring crew bigger. in when you need and them. And we will bring, yeah, as soon as we get some transmission, uh, uh, some commissions, we'll, we'll do that, yeah, yeah. And on the editorial role, I don't know if anybody knows, so it's the runner, junior researcher, researcher, assistant AP, producer, series producer, exec, yeah. That's how it is. But the thing is, what, we, what the BBC had, we had producer directors and they were self-shooting. So we would have, certainly for documentaries, if you think of the nature of it, you are building your trust with your contributors. So you're not gonna have DOPs, you're gonna, you are there, you are filming actuality. You are, so it's, it's a skeletal crew because that you've gotta be, be filming. Yeah. That was one thing that anyone yeah. was here for Karen Walsh, that's yes. exactly what Karen yeah. said, you yeah. know, she went yeah. from having a team of about six or yes. seven when she yeah. started to just being her in mm. the end. Mm. And, that's, and again, it's another one of the things we want people to be able to do everything. Yes, because exactly. That's what you'll need exactly. to do. Exactly, yeah. 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 And also a lot of our researchers do sound. And this is what I loved about, produ this produ as I said, what I'm really keen on production management, following the sort of suit that you don't just have to just be office bound. You know, I've got, as I said, my, my Sam is fantastic. He, um, he's been offered so many times, do you want to do the editorial? He said, no, I just love organising. He's brilliant. But he loves dipping his hand into the editorial and he's allowed to do that. Because we want, you know, we, we're all individuals. It's all about inclusivity, about, you know, 
whatever you bring to the table your skills and it's a sum of parts it shouldn't just be defined by your role basically i think anyone else got questions there were some others the yes. Was that just specific to the BBC? Was that kind of general? Concept? No, that sort of. Well, that I've given you sort of probably what I've just been embedded from the BBC. What I've learnt since being out in the indie market is the slight variations, and so you would get production secretaries to product coordinators, yes, to product, junior production managers, and then production managers. The editorial route, yeah, researcher, assistant producer, but there's producers, straight producers, and then what they would do is they would produce the program and they would bring in then series directors to shoot the visuals, where we haven't really done that because we were, I think the BBC just sort of got the pennies worth and you just did everything <laughs> um, and signed you up for life. But, um, so, yes, absolutely. Um, no, oh, not, I have a... Um, so, yes, so, so you can have, so for example, if you were, if you had your specialism in arts, I would expect to have a producer who knew their, um, they knew their craft, sorry, they knew their sort of... Um, Sector? Se genre. Yeah, yeah, the genre. Yeah. Um, and that would be their expertise. So, and then for, um, obviously, studios completely different. You just put live on the front of all the, um, the categories, a live studio research, a live studio producer, and they're, they're different. So you would, so again, it's it's what it's what sort of genre you want to go into as well. So there what, are slight. What's variances. the difference between what, what would be different than what you were doing between working on a live show and working on something that wasn't live? No. Okay. So if so, certainly. So it's it's how it's so okay. So from the editorial point of view, which you probably need to know because if you're doing that, so you would have to. So we don't have self shooters really on the live. So you need people who understand, who who know and work the live studio floor. So it's doing the briefing notes and doing the uh, research of your of your interviewees, uh, setting up live elements, and you understand what works well in live and what doesn't. So and it's it's all that sort of side of stuff. So you don't really have that relationship with your. Con Tributed that much, you know what I mean? Because you are, because it's more background, yeah. It's background research, I would say. Um, and also, you just have to understand the jargon as well for live, reading scripts and understanding running orders. So it's all very timings and all that sort of stuff. Like I, that's why it. I didn't go the editorial side of live. <laughs> um, and then obviously, Again, so, so let's go through the genre. So docs, I would expect small crew, really highly skilled, high access, access um, capabilities. So it's dealing with the police, dealing with, so that's the type of genre I do. So we would very care, very sensitive, um, building those relationships. So it's, you, but they would have to self-shoot our directors on that. You've got features who, um, short form, we do short, like for Watchdog, we would have uh, short form filmmakers and it's really difficult to make a three or four minute piece, I would say, compared, you know what I mean? It's just as equally as hard to make a 60 minute as, as you know what I mean? It, well, I, it's it's got to make it's a, a lot of sense set, in it, yeah. Absolutely. So are those right. mostly independents then, that we would, for, to make those features, you say you're mostly working with independent. Oh, we're on the one show, the yeah. small insets. Or they're yeah, all BBC, so they're not no. BBC employees. No, from no, 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 no. So we would have, so say there's three inserts in a programme, two of those would definitely be made by Indies or in house. Not many in house anymore, it's all yeah. Indies, yeah. So how do people get to be that Indie? What's, how do you get in front of the one show? How do you get in front of the one show? Uh, well, the thing is, they, ha they would have, so, th so they would need, to, you'd need to do, so you'd need to find out. Uh, we've got commissioning editors who work with the indies, so you need to find out what the brief is and what, because the thing is the BBC has to have a certain amount of hours on the show of current affairs, certain amount of topical, um, uh, what else, uh, oh God, consumer, natural history, so they'll have a certain amount of hours and then they will get to have a commissioning round where you go and pitch. So in each indie would pitch. So is, that pub, is that information publicly available, no, or is it I very much closed shop? Very much closed. Yeah, I mean, I can find out. I mean, the thing is, we, yeah, no, I don't, no, 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 no. Would you like is, to know? know? I'd like to know. Seb, Seb's, um, still he was a commissioning editor for the one show. So it's just it's finding those 
those opportunities for non non um, yeah, well, non-indies, non-traditional indies who want to be a pitch for those. But, um, but yeah, I can ask. Yes, yes. Sorry. I, worked, I worked for Icon. Did um, you? Yeah, I did, yeah. yeah. So I remember when they put the treatment together, yeah. which is this huge pamphlet. Massive. Like, over a hundred um, yeah. different ideas for shows they wanted to yeah. commission, which were the little excerpts. Absolutely, for, yeah. one show. I yeah. think that's mainly how they did it. Yeah. I think it's like it's maybe once a year. Yeah, we like, do. I remember I, the office was mental. Yeah. Everyone was just like going for this yeah. deadline to make we, sure. Yeah, we like, sat in. But, I yeah, because I came. I went for one of the commissioning meetings. And I remember it was just files everywhere, and everyone they just had to go through it. And it, that was the it took about three or four days commissioning around. And then we have a fantastic lady called Claire, who runs the um, scheduling. So you can imagine the schedule board for all those films and she needs to know when things are delivering and that's how it's very really clever because then they look at people coming up on the show because we have a celebrity booker and then they will look and say well actually let's tag that film to that person yeah so they might move a feature down they've got so they might move the delivery of that like actually can we have that sooner rather than later and but for current affairs and consumer that is that that's just a trundling thing because we will have one consumer program per, uh, insert per program or something it might have changed i mean i've been away from the one show for about three or four years well four or five years now so but that's how we used to do it there's a lot of juggling yeah. and when you're talking about um the kind of small documentary cues with access mm. do you specifically find so a director who has worked on loads of police things because he knows people in the police no so not like no i think it's just it's just somebody that you know and trust that you can make sure that they are going to handle a very delicate situation right and it's not about well that person knows the head of da 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 i mean sasha because he's worked on drugs land and he's got he's got incredible relationships with the police who are feeding him things like actually this is a great initiative what about this for a program la 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 but i think um once you it's all building up that trust and that reputation reputation is everything because unfortunately, there's seven degrees of separation in this industry. And especially, certainly with my name, you'll remember it, you know what I mean? And it's like, I can't do anything wrong, I can't, you know. But, but joking aside, it's, it's about sort of making sure that you are thorough, you are honest, you know, it's, it's safeguarding trust, you know, so, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, could you uh, share some thoughts on motivation? and um, maybe what your day looks like. Yeah. Um, so how, you know, yeah. quite specific, like what do you do in the morning and okay. how do you stay energized and how do okay. you push through? And okay. Okay, so um, I'll talk about Marble, but I'll talk about maybe in, in the BBC when I've worked on projects, like really quite busy ones. Um, for me, uh, it's a can-do attitude, and I think... You have to go in, instead of worrying about something that night before, you can't, you can't do anything. You just go in and you think, yeah, I've got to keep positive. And I think you will have lists and lists of things to go through. And it doesn't matter if, you, and I, I, so I stay, sit in the morning and I make a list of things I need to achieve. And if I've achieved three or four, I'm like, hey. What, what, I, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, my husband, yeah, yeah. My husband gets in at, uh, up at five. So what time, so I, Okay, shall I tell you a typical day I had on the one shows? Is that because that because that's that because that's that's the most I I think that is a good representation of a day. So I would get up and I'd be at my desk for about nine o'clock, eight thirty, nine o'clock. Okay, I like to get in early and I like to go through my emails that I have missed from the day before, and then people start coming in and then we would go and sit in the green room about nine thirty and we would have a debrief about that program. Okay, so I would be making notes from that meeting. I would then sit, um, I would then go, we would then go into a meeting of that day's programs, the TX meeting. So I would sit there with the script and I would go through health and safety stuff basically. So I, so say for example, oh, and then we've got this, uh, we've got this contributor and they're bringing this parrot in and they're bringing this and I'm going, right, we have got, you know, somebody, an um, handler for that parrot and la la la, and what's the health, is it on the health and safety risk assessment? Is it this and that? So 
there's all these things that I'm looking at the script, they're all having a great time. I said, oh, should we say this? And, or should we move that there? And I'm thinking, right, <laughs> who's, who's on the floor? There's a lot of people here. What, you know, is, is anyone thought about this? Anyone thought about that? So I'm just the eyes over the script thinking, making sure everything is in order. Then come out and then we will probably, then we have a bit of a break and then I would have a budget meeting and update with my coordinators to make sure that we're all sort of, you know, on target for whatever's being filmed that day and they would come to me with any problems. It's all very ad hoc on the one show because... They're responsive. Very responsive yeah. because you can't just say, well, actually, that's your lot of time. You're constantly firefighting and just being around for everybody. So you're in constant... Come on, you have to be. And I think leading a team, you can't be sitting there going, oh, God, this day's really... You just have to be right. Okay, next. And you know, and, and I like humour. I, you know, I, I like being sarcastic and, I, and in a good way. And I think it just keeps everyone bouncing along. Um, so I would, so I'd be, I'd be doing, so I'd be having those meetings in the morning, and then we would go into the next day's production. So we would have a script meeting. What's coming up? Um, and that's really important because I want to make sure that uh, we're hitting all the targets for that in terms of, again, the logistics, setting up and what have you. We might have separate meetings because they've got something quite big in the piazza coming up that they want to do in a week's time. So you may be sitting having meetings with heads of department who need to know insurance and or more in, you know, in depth health and safety. Then I would, ha then we do have a, st we do, did have a staff meeting each day just to make sure we went through the schedule. So I had to be having that constantly updated. So this is now coming into the afternoon, mostly set up my desk and had lunch. So I don't really, you don't really get a break. And then as soon as the, as soon as the studio team come in, they come and talk to me and they would probably go through all their um, schedules and make sure that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. And then I would go on studio to make sure everything's set and everything's fine and do any health and safety checks. So I would be a part of that. And then I would then be able to, probably about four o'clock when they're starting to rehearse, that's downtime for me. So that's me doing my emails because I'm not needed because I've set up everything in the day with the coordinators and that's their responsibility. And then I just sort of carry on. So and are you do there that. for the actual show? Not necessarily. So I do stay for the show. You do. And I would go into the green room and look after, make sure the guest is looked after as well. So it's a long day. Sure. It is a long day. It used to be, I'd say, 8.30 till 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. So it's almost like a theatre production, but a different yeah. show every year. Yeah, it is, it is. Yeah. But it's a well-ordered machine. Yeah. And so you, can't, you know where the day goes, you know at two o'clock, right, okay, I need to be doing this or, or, or checking on that. Oh. Another question. Go on. Do you, did you do or do you do something extracurricular for yourself to help yourself stay sane and like the, the feeds your soul in a different way? I like your question. Do you know what? What do I do? <sighs> My problem, and I think it's inherent with this, no, production management job, you are like, and I don't mean this, it's, I was like mother hen on the one show. And so basically I gave my all and I looked after my team and I think, and I don't mean this in, a, in a, any big headed way, but that's I think why I was quite popular as a production manager because Jane will sort it. Jane, just throw Jane into the hard one, she'll pull the team together, da da da. But it, at the cost of my detriment, ask my husband that I used to come back completely drained um, and then you do it all over again. And, but I like, but I love it. It's not as if like, oh, I've got to do this. It's not a fun, I generally love working in big teams. Um, what do I do to keep me sane? I listen to a lot of Brian Eno. <laughs> <laughs> and my head first, were you? Um, I, I've tried to change my work life balance because it got too much and I had a little boy and then I did the talent thing and I did uh, three days a week and doing a job share which was perfect but I couldn't production manage. What I'm finding difficult now is going back into production management and just doing two days a week is that you can never really switch off. I don't have days off, I'm still constantly looking at my emails um, but I don't mind doing that because we're such a small entity it's not as if I can switch off and also the, the teams that are working are embedded in really difficult locations at the moment and really obviously county line stuff and drugs you know it's pretty um it's difficult it's very stressful for them so um i m 
my time off is sort of guided by the type of programs I'm working on at the time. If I can get away with it, then great. I, can, I, can, I don't have to worry about that because I've got fantastic cohorts who can just keep, keep me sort of away. I've got two Springer Spaniels that keep me um, entertained and I live out in Chew Valley, so I've, I'm living out in the sticks, so I don't feel too, so I feel quite removed and I think that's worked really well this time coming back to work. That I'm, I, and I can say to them, I'm only in Bristol on Tuesdays and Thursdays and that's it and I don't do any other days and I just work from home. So, um, but you don't, you don't switch off, but you do have to do some self-preservation because it can all consume you. Um, and you've got to be really careful of that. You can't be everything to everybody. All the time. All the time. It's impossible, it's impossible. And nobody thanks you for it. No, no, they, do, <laughs> no they do thank you for it, they do. But, it's, it's, but you've got to get that balance. Yeah. You really have got to get that You're no balance. good to people that if you break yourself, you have to. Yeah, totally, it. totally, totally. Um, anyone else? Go on, um, how do you get the best out of people? Oh. The best out of people. Yeah. I think it's just what we said, it's encouragement because I, what I do to get the best out is like, I know I've been here and I totally relate. The things you don't know, things you're going to get wrong. I'm still getting things wrong. I'm still learning. I'm nearly 50. It's, it, it's don't ever think that you've got to present yourself and like all bells and whistles, you can come. I always, I, I sometimes look at CVs and said, you need to deconstruct yourself to reconstruct yourself because it's, because everybody's like, I've got to do it, I've got to do Do you know what? Honesty, really, really important. Put your hand up, don't know, but I'm really willing to learn. And being proactive, instead of just sitting there waiting for things to come to you, go out there and just, just say, well, look what, you know, you, do things for yourself. Do you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Just don't, don't expect it to come to you. You've got to be hungry for it and you've got to put the bloody hard work in. You've got to be. And also treat people the way you want to be treated. That's all. That's what I would say. Chocolate biscuits. Totally. Totally. <laughs> it's yeah, all about no, chocolate biscuits. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> that, that's my, that's how my, my, so my success I would say has been, and I'd say it is a success. It's been an amazing journey I've had and opportunities. Great ambassadors. Because you know what? I've been true to myself. I've been honest. And uh, I've generally loved it. I've been enthusiastic and I want to learn, and I want to help, and give something back. That's what I would say. And treat everyone exactly the way I would have been treated. I want to be treated. I say that's a brilliant way to end. Okay. So. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, we're, we're going to do a couple of questions with Jane afterwards, yeah, so if anyone's got yeah. any questions they want to yeah. ask you, but otherwise yeah. I would say. So who's going to be production manager? Hey! Yeah. <laughs> brilliant, thank, yeah, you, thank very you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you.